Can I go to a barbecue? Should your children go back to school? And can someone with absolutely no symptoms be spreading the coronavirus? Medical Director of Infectious Diseases, John Bradley from Rady Children's Hospital explains. So what do we know as of today? We're in July now. Yes. We're in the summer. What does that mean for us today? Uh, as of today, the masks and distancing are still important. What we thought last February and March, when we first started having our discussions, was that this coronavirus hopefully would act like all the other coronaviruses we see each year, only in the winter, and then they go away in the summer, just like influenza. And we were hoping this virus would also go away. Well, it's not. Whether it's because it, it spreads more efficiently, there are so many susceptible people, we don't know. But the fact is, this virus is not toning down during the summer. It's not going away. And all we need to do is to let up our guard and expose susceptible people to those who have the infection and the infection spreading. And now that we're testing, we're able to pick up many of those people who have no symptoms, who were exposed to someone who's got the infection. So our ability to track the spread of virus so much better now than it was in March or April. And, and our county uh, in San Diego is now able to track all the positive cases within just a few days. So uncontrolled community spread hasn't, hasn't occurred yet, but boy, we're popping up with all of these small outbreaks. The county knows it, they're on it, they're, they're contacting every contact, they're tracing all of the contacts of an active case to make sure that they don't continue to spread the virus. So, so all of the cautions that we were taking in, in March and April, we still need to take. And it looks now like the vaccine is going to be the turning point where all of the masks and the distancing uh, uh, can be let go. There's some concerns for parents when we start to see the, the numbers starting to go up, because we've had a few record days in, in San Diego um, of what's gonna happen come August when these kids, we wanna send our kids back to school. So as these numbers creep up, we're in the summer, people wanna go to the beach, they, they're doing barbecues, they wanna see their family. If these numbers continue to go up, what would this mean for our kids in schools come August? So it's a great question, and we're all concerned about kids spreading it. Um, there's, and, and we actually know there's more information that kids, if they have the infection, are more likely to be asymptomatic. So kids will, will likely spread it even more efficiently than adults that have symptoms. But we don't want any spread in schools. What we have now is the fact that all the schools are aware of risks all the parents and uh, the state you know department of education has issued guidelines so each school is preparing for uh distancing and and checking kids and masking for the older kids if appropriate and and now that we have the capacity to test and our, and our Rady Children's Hospital will, will be able to test up to 2,000 samples per day within the next week or two. So we're going to be ready when schools open, if kids come to their doctors with, with any question, uh, and each of the healthcare systems will be able to do this too. Uh, Scripps, Sharp, Kaiser, uh, UCSD, all of them. Uh, and, and the tests will be easily accessible and we get the results. So if a child picks it up at school, our hope now is that we'll be able to identify it early and trace the contacts of that child. And there may be a classroom that's shut down for a while, perhaps a school, but we're not, we don't think we'll have to shut down all schools uh, uh, we think we can keep track of spread within the schools now that we have the capacity to test. Shali, 
my friends are having parties and baby showers and birthday parties and barbecues, 100 people. I'm looking at pictures of 20, 30, 40 people, no masks, standing next to each other. I mean, I get like, we want to see each other. We, I miss a lot yeah, of my, my of friends and my family as well. Of course you do. There's a way to probably take some sort of risk and be smart about it. Smarter, lower the risk. What do you want people to know when they grab their purse and put on their shoes and they head to a barbecue or party with no face covering, no social distancing? What, what do you want them to know? You're putting yourself at risk of getting infected. And, and you know if you've got kids and you've been around people over the past couple of weeks, you could be infected and not know it and you could be spreading it to people. So, so now that we have the evidence about asymptomatic carriage and spread, it just makes no sense that you would go to a place like that without putting on a mask and keeping it some distance. Uh, you know, six feet is optimal. You may not always get that, but wearing the mask is the ace up your sleeve. That, that you won't get infected and you won't infect other people. So, so there's a social part of this, Shally, that you need to help me with. And on, on, on my way home, there are people with, with posters on the side of the street saying, I'm suffocating. And I'm looking at them and I'm going, but you're alive and <laughs> you're okay and you're not spreading it. But they, they believe they have the personal right to not wear masks, but then they're putting others at risk. So how do you balance personal rights with public health? I don't have the answer to that. I'm, I'm looking to you to help guide me. I can do the science. The science is easy here. It's how you convince the public of the need because we're all in this together. And, and that's an important question. So as people go out, if, if you want to protect other people around you, please wear a mask. Please wear a mask. Uh, and if you don't, you're putting everybody else at risk. And, it's, and the person that you expose who might get infected could then take it home to the grandfather or grandmother at home and infect them, and, and there's still deaths in, in older people. That's still happening. The death rate in California is still very high in the elderly. So even if you're pretty asymptomatic, if you're spreading it, you can potentially link to someone who spreads it to someone who will get really seriously ill. And it's not just the elderly, Dr. Bradley. I know several people who tested positive for COVID-19, uh, one of which in my immediate family earlier on, many months ago. And we just had a conversation, uh, my husband did, with somebody who was in a coma and 46 years old, says never got a flu in his whole entire life yeah. and has been fighting and it's been a month and he still doesn't have energy to work. I can't tell you how many times I've heard these stories. So it's still these, these random stories that you hear, yes. even though we say the chances of it are lower, but it's still happening. It doesn't mean that you need to be in your elderly or a diabetic or pre-existing conditions. This is also affecting younger people. Yes, so, so the death rate is, is still highest in the older people. If you look at San Diego statistics, uh, way more than half the people who are dying are, are over, 70. Um, and if you take that to 60, three quarters of the people who are dying. Not that there aren't others who are younger who aren't dying. And, and we know what all conditions are associated with, with increased risk. But the other point that you bring up, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that this is a serious illness and we were comparing it with influenza. Influenza knocks you out. It can. And you're like down for a week and then it takes you a week or two to get over it. One of my colleagues, a, a younger doctor, infectious disease, at the very beginning of this epidemic, pandemic, 
in Nashville caught the virus. And he, and he said it's like the worst flu he'd ever had. And, and the energy thing, you, he can't get back to work and fully do all the stuff that he was doing before. It's taking weeks to get back on his feet. So, uh, so you're absolutely right. For those people who are symptomatic, this is not a trivial illness. Um, a, apart from the ones who die, where it's obviously not a trivial illness, and apart from those who are asymptomatic, there's this group who get really sick. And we don't know all the risk factors that, or the genetics of the response of each person that, that basically shows uh, who's going to get sick and who's not. A lot of people working on that question. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because we've heard um, many reports that, they, that doctors are still learning long term uh, what this does. We just heard from an NBA uh, basketball player who uh, tested positive months ago and says he still can't, he still can't smell. Okay. He still can't smell. So this, this will take time to understand the long-term effects of this virus as well. It will. It will. And, and the more we actually are able to test for it, the more we realize how many of these really vague symptoms, like loss of smell, are associated with the virus itself. And not everyone has loss of smell, but it is so common that, that when you walked into our medical building here, one of the questions yeah. that we asked you was, have you had any change in your sense of I know. smell? And now I just smell everything because I want to make sure I am okay. <laughs> Dr. Bradley, the golden question, and everybody will ask this until it is really over, is when will this be over? When can we have some normalcy back to our lives again? And will we? It, it, I'm sorry to say it will probably not be until the vaccine is, is available. So uh, there's no summer break. The virus is still out there. And there are so many of us who are still susceptible. And we, and we know how easily spread the virus is that the masking will be important until we get immunized. So there are, um, on, a, on an international conference call just last week, there are five companies that are racing to get their vaccines out. There's three major types of vaccines that are in trials. Each one of them is going to test 30,000 people. And, and we should have results by this fall. And they're all ramping up for production. And, and one, one really nice thing about what Congress did to fund research is that, is that these vaccine companies are actually given a guarantee by the federal government that the federal government will buy millions of doses from them. So the risk of the vaccine company of ramping up production as quickly as possible is gone. They don't have to worry about all the cost of making a vaccine and testing it and then, and then have someone say, oh, your vaccine's not as good as this vaccine. No one's going to use it. The government is going to buy everyone's vaccines. So everyone's already ramping up for millions of doses, shall we? When will I see the vaccine? And I know Dr. Mm -hmm. Anthony Fauci had also expressed some concern that because there is a, a really large disbelief in science and some of the people who live, especially in the United States, there's a very large group of people who said they won't even get the vaccine if it comes out. And then what will happen then? So we, as you know, there are parents who don't believe in vaccines, which is, which is sad. And, and generally, for most of the parents I've talked to, when you actually explain to them what the vaccines are and how the benefits of vaccine outweigh the small risks, they're, they're OK with getting immunized. Um, uh, there will always be people who, who believe that it's their, it's their personal right, and I, I give them that, that they don't want to be immunized. But you can be immunized, and if you're immunized and the unimmunized person gets infected, you'll be protected. So you can go out shopping. Uh, we, you can have people come into your TV studio and sit with you if you're immunized and they're immunized and you don't have to worry. So I'm not so worried about all those people who don't get immunized 
uh, for my benefit. I worry for their health, but, but it won't prevent me from, from going to a movie theater um, or a restaurant um, or my wife, who, who will also get immunized as soon as the vaccine's out. The, the, in terms of vaccine, there's a couple different types of vaccine. And each one will be tested for both safety and immunogenicity to make sure that it provides by blood test the response that you expect. The protective efficacy the, to make sure that those who are immunized when they are in contact with someone with the virus don't get infected. That's going to be a tougher bar to, to, to jump over. And the FDA is going to be working with all these companies to make sure that once their vaccines are released, and I'm sure there'll be an emergency use authorization, just the way there is for remdesivir for treatment. But the vaccines will be out, and people will track how good they are. <clears throat> and probably within a year or two, we'll know which the best vaccines are. But my guess is by early next year, uh, the vaccines will become available for us. And you'll be able to go to your clinician, your, your health care provider, <clears throat> and say, I'm on the front lines. I need a vaccine. And, and, and they'll make an appointment for you, and you'll get one of the vaccines. Early next year means we have a tough few months and influenza season, flu season, also headed our, our way. So what do you predict is going to happen over the next few months until this vaccine comes out in 2021? Uh, I, <clears throat> well, uh, I think that influenza is not going to circulate as it does every year if we wear our masks. And, and I showed you a graph a few months ago where uh, we track the numbers of cases of influenza and respiratory syncytial virus, all the viruses that kids get, each week. And, and once we instituted masks in San Diego, Dr. Wilma, Wilma Wooten instituted those uh, uh, mandates, the numbers of respiratory viruses plummeted. And we compared this with all the past years, and we've never seen all these viruses go away at the same time the way we saw this year. So I think if people keep wearing their masks to prevent coronavirus, we will also limit the spread of, of influenza. And, but we've got treatment for influenza. So even if the vaccine is not matched with the strain that's circulating, so you don't get as much protection as we'd hope, and you get sick with influenza uh, for some reason, if you don't wear your mask, um, we can at least have an oral treatment uh, there's actually two drugs approved now uh, if you get influenza. <clears throat> no oral drugs available for coronavirus, just the one IV so far. Is there anything else you would like to add, Dr. Bradley? Any other new information that would be valuable for people to know? Uh, just, ju just the fact that I'm so grateful to you to be able to sit down and explain this to you because if someone asks me a question and I have 30 seconds to answer it, I can't get all of the context around my answer. So the fact that you, you get it, you understand all of the nuance and, and all of the justification behind the changing recommendations, that, that to me is more valuable than any single piece of information. And I want to thank you. Well, I want to thank you because there are many people, every time they see these interviews and the information, they also ask me to thank you for this information because the truth and the science and the medicine, as we've heard time and time again, that's what's going to get us out of this yes. at some point. It will. It will. <laughs> it will. And we'll celebrate that. We, absolutely. <laughs> There's no question about that. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Thank you so much, Sally. You've been listening to It Is What It Is with Shali Zomorodi. You can join in and ask your questions live on Shali's Facebook or Instagram page. You can find so much more by following Shali on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and by visiting shaldi.com.